and in committee of CAP. Let's get the table board meetings for those in the audience with some housekeeping items. For those in the public, please keep your participation on mute. For those on the phone, use star six to mute and unmute. And then what we're gonna do is we're going to first, um, We're here if there's any comments from the board and then from the public by raising your hands. Are there any comments or announcements from the board? No. No. Okay. Any from those that's in the room? Comments or announcements? And then for those that are joining us via Zoom, if by show of hands, if you have a comment or announcement, if you could raise your hand. Thank you. Our purpose is to advance justice reinvestment and protect community investments. Some of our responsibilities are as follows. Recommend programs related policies around both existing and new funding opportunities with a focus on evidence practice, local, regional, and national innovation and recommendations for implementation. Engage providers to educate CAF and our committee members about their work, outcome, needs, and recommendation. Promote a structure for and implementation of comprehensive need assessments for the county reentry population. What's working, what's needed to inform future programs, recommendation, and funding allocation. Participate in programs and service related RFP development process and panels by assignments from committee chairs and our CAF overview. And then I just want to say thank you for your commitment to being on here. Now we can go on to our agenda. We'll have introduction from the board. I'm Latanya Thompson, West County, and I am chair of the subcommittee. Well, I'm, my name is Renee Hurley, and I represent West County. So my name is Rita Moore. Um, I'm an East County resident. And I will then open it up to other CAB members. Good morning, Audrey Carter, chairperson of CAB. No. Nicole? Uh, Nicole Green, uh, chair of Pro uh, policy and budget. Forgot where I was for a second. Okay, thank you. And then for the staff, Hi, good morning, everyone. Patrice Guillory here from the Office of Reentry and Justice. Good morning, Gariana Youngblood, also here with the Office of Reentry and Justice. Good morning, Kimia Seo from the Office of Reentry and Justice. Good morning, Michelle Elizondo from the Office of Reentry and Justice. Good morning, um, Liana Willis with the Office of Reentry and Justice. I'll, I'll now give the, those that's in the room the opportunity to introduce themselves. Good morning, Jana Evans, Lead Reentry Transition Specialist, Game Plan for Success, Office of Education, working in the three county jails. Good morning, I'm Jody Sikandar, the Director of Inmate Services for the Sheriff's Office. Morning, Jason Moore, Assistant Chair of the House Chair House. And now we'll move on to um, public comments or any items under the Jury District of the Community Advisory Board that is not on this agenda. The next thing on the agenda is approval of the minutes from our last meeting on December 21st, 2023. Um, it's attachment one, pages four through six, if we could review those. Give us a minute to review them.
This is Rena Moore. I call for a motion to approve the minutes of um, December 21st last year. Rena Hurley, I second. Can we move to? Um, yeah, well, okay. Yeah. Gary, uh, when they're ready. yeah. Um, can I, yes, all in favor of approving the minutes of from December 24th, 21st, 2023, say aye. Aye. Any objection? Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Next on the agenda is the in-custody survey update. Yeah, so I'll open this up. Um, first of all, uh, I'd like to say we are really, really excited uh, to bring forth um, a, a set of findings from two different methods. Uh, I know that this is probably more than what the cab actually asked for, but you know, hey, go big or go home, right? So um, per the cab's request, uh, you all asked that ORJ uh, facilitate a uh, survey uh, in partnership with the Sheriff's Office of individuals who are currently in custody to get a sense of their uh, needs, uh, what, um, from their perspective, uh, were services or resources that they would need while they're in custody or, or uh, upon release. Uh, so we were able to do that. And what we have for you today um, are the uh, findings or the results of that survey. Kimmy will be uh, presenting that information with you all. You also have um, folks from the Sheriff's Office today um, who um, were incredibly instrumental in helping us uh, distribute the surveys um, throughout all three detention facilities. So any questions you might have in terms of um, how distribution went on, what some of the challenges that might be for doing uh, something uh, of this magnitude in the future, um, certainly I'm sure they'll be able to assist with that. And then separately, we also have members from um, uh, RDA, they're a consulting group that's working very closely with our county's health department. And they're in the process of rolling out Cal AIM um, Justice Initiative. So this is a state mandate that will allow for the extension of Medi-Cal coverage for individuals who are currently incarcerated. They also um, 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 conducted a, a sort of a feedback um, um, effort, if you will, in custody with individuals through focus groups. And so they'll be uh, able to share shortly after Kimmy some of the responses from those, um, those activities also. What you'll probably hear are quite similar themes and responses, both from the written surveys and then also from those who participated in the focus groups. So um, we have uh, come a long way from our initial surveying and receiving feedback from our AB 109 um, providers, both our county agencies and our community um, program providers. This is a slightly different lens in that we're hearing directly from individuals that are in custody. So without further ado, I will pass it on to Kimmy who will uh, present to us the findings from uh, our basic custody survey. All right, thank you, Patrice. Um, so good morning, everybody. Um, as Patrice said, my name is Kimmy Aseo and I'm a planner evaluator here in the ORJ. It's a pleasure to be here with you all this morning. Um, so why am I here? <laughs> like Patrice said, I'm here to share the findings of the CAB Program and Services Subcommittee's in-custody survey for the fiscal year 23-24. Um, so this is the first in-custody survey conducted by the CAB. Um, the goal today is to cover the purpose and overview of the survey, discuss the overarching themes, um, touch on some noteworthy comments across responses, and then finally summarize the findings of the survey. Um, for those interested, including in this meeting's agenda packet is a more detailed survey report. Um, with that said, there's a lot of information to cover, so let's dive right in. So in partnership with the Sheriff's Office and staff, um, for, a 14-question survey consisting of multiple choice and narrative questions was distributed on August 8th, 2023 to the jail populations at the Martinez, West County and Marsh Creek detention facilities. Um, a Spanish translation of the survey was also made available. Individuals who had uh, one week to complete the survey, at which point the surveys were collected and submitted to the ORJ for analysis. A total of 97 responses, representing 97 unique and in justice involved individuals currently incarcerated in the county's jail facilities were received. 
A qualitative thematic analysis was conducted by two independent reviewers from the ORJ who coded the survey responses for patterns and then met to negotiate consensus and achieve inter-rater reliability. So who participated in the survey? So what we know about them is, as shown in the graphics on this slide, we can see that the majority of the participants were Black males between the age of 26 to 45 years old. About 60% of participants came from the Martinez Detention Facility, while a quarter of the participants came from West County. Um, of individuals who participated in the survey, there was a fairly equal distribution for those awaiting trial and those serving a jail sentence. So we also know that a meaningful percentage of individuals struggled with the learning and physical disability. Here in the graphic on the left, we can see that approximately a third of individuals self-reported a learning disability, while approximately one in five individuals reported a physical disability. In the graphic on the right, we can see that poor mental health and drug use conditions range between a quarter and a third of the population. It is important to recognize that these conditions are self-reported. So we don't know whether the individual has been diagnosed by a physician for the disabilities and or health um, conditions reported. So now that we know a bit about who participated in the survey, um, we'll now transition to what we've learned from participants. More specifically, we'll touch on their in-custody and re-entry needs. So in custody, we learned that behavioral health supports are the most frequently identified in custody need. This finding is in alignment with the prior slide surrounding the distribution of mental health and drug use. This was evident in survey data collected from participants who specifically mentioned the need for access to substance use treatment, such as NA and AA, and other mental health supports to deal with PTSD and anger management to better support individuals from recidivating. Similarly, many participants noted the need for more reentry and pro-social supports while in custody, such as increased access to reentry service organizations, more rec recreational time, and extended visiting time to interact with their family and friends. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and read one of the quotes here. So this is a quote from a respondent. Um, so one respondent said that what's most needed, in my opinion, in jail are visits but some people's loved ones don't have transportation and nighttime unlock and free time because during the day, people's kids and loved ones are at work or school. Another respondent said that more services and help when released, uh, real, real help that will help us not come back. Now upon re-entry, as we have seen time and time and again, Housing and employment remain the most critical needs of those returning to the community. Other common themes identified were income and public benefits such as social security disability insurance or SSDI and social security income, SSI, um, and transportation. These findings are aligned with what we learned in the provider study. So not unlike re-entry services needed, housing and employment were identified as the most needed services to support re-entry goals. Participants specifically mentioned the need for stable, affordable housing, low income housing, and more housing resources. Um, one participant responded, I've been incarcerated since I was 17. My greatest concern or worry will be my housing. Another said, I currently have no home to return to. Um, and another said, having a place to stay while I can um, get some income to survive with. E employment was another prevalent theme of services needed to support reentry goals. From data collected from the survey, participants noted the need for better employment opportunities that earn a living wage, as well as jobs suitable to individuals' interests. The need for employment is evidenced by these quotes. Uh, a participant stated that work, workforce connecting inmates with jobs and training. Another said, finding good employment that fits me. So while not common enough to be identified as a theme, there were several comments within the survey responses that stood out as particularly meaningful and worthy of future consideration. 
not only because they were mentioned as a response to the survey, but because we've also heard others express similar needs through our DPOs as well as partner and partners and providers. The first noteworthy comment was to establish reentry housing services, specifically for sex offenders, as many providers do not house individuals with 290 convictions. Um, the second is that participants also mentioned the need for professional dental health services for individuals in custody to address oral health care. The third, participants also uh, mentioned the need to be connected to SSI or SSDI legal out advocate while in custody. And the last noteworthy comment here speaks to the need for more faith-based programming to build camaraderie in the community to address challenges, empower individuals, and improve the lives of the community at large. So this survey is the first of its kind to be conducted by the ORJ on behalf of the CAB. While the sample of participants is not considered to be representative of the population of all individuals held in custody, what we learned today can be viewed as a stepping stone to inform reentry services and program needs of the county's justice impacted population. As aligned with the findings of the AB 109 provider survey, there is critical need for housing and employment for individuals returning to the community. Furthermore, the lack of low income housing, limited employment opportunities, and large proportion of justice impacted individuals self-reporting as substance use or mental health disorder creates an even greater challenge for successful reentry. Lastly, individuals in custody are seeking more access to pre-release behavioral health and pro-social programming. If you haven't already, I recommend that you, um, and I strongly encourage um, that everyone reads the in-custody survey report. Again, it's attached to the agenda and we'll provide you with um, more detailed understanding of our findings from the survey. Um, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to take a little bit of time to answer them now. Anyone have any questions? I can't see the participants online, though. Are there any questions from those that are joining via Zoom? I'm not seeing any. I seen any, Kimmy. Great. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. Um, if anyone has additional questions, um, feel free to contact me. Um, that's my email on the screen there. But thank you. Thank you so much for that information, Kimmy. So can I can I make some comments though? I don't have any questions, Kimmy. Sure. Um, I guess just more like these were very closed ended statements. Like we don't offer these services in the jail. And a lot of that didn't seem like that that's not true on a lot of it. Like it, we do have AA and NA go to every module on the jail or Maybe in future, some of these questions might be like, how long has the participant been in custody? Because they may not know of the services that are on yet. Um, same thing for mental health, medical. Those are, I, I can't speak for them, but I can tell you that they just have to pick up a phone and they get access to all of that or send a request slip, same difference. Um, Jana and, and Nicole could both talk about their reentry and how we offer those programs. Some of it is, uh, Some of it is just the newness probably of the individual in custody and not knowing. We also have, at the time of this, we did these hand surveys. These were handwritten. These were not done on the tablets. We do have tablets in the facilities now. So a caveat with all that is we have a better way to supply information to all the, all the individuals in custody versus what we did before. So I feel like while a lot of this information is helpful, it's not all fully true. Like it's not, we do offer most of the services that were talked about here, but we don't have a way to, I don't know, there's no, there's no answer to that on this survey. It was like, there is no NA or NA. There, um, or they do need dental and oral health care, but we do offer all that. You know what I mean? Like we could have, uh, maybe next time if you could reach out and we could work together and then that way I know what we need to communicate instead of what we don't have. Does that make sense? Yeah. Can I can I respond to that really quickly? So, uh, and I think we noted it in the report um, that came out uh, came up a lot, not only in terms of in custody ser uh, services, but also uh, uh, post release services. 
there was um, response from um, from the respondent that they stated that they, you know, that these were the services that they needed um, or that they were unaware of services, but then also named later and named certain organizations that they were familiar with. So I think you're right because the the the, the detention facility it is such a you know, revolving towards a transient sort of um, not transient, but in terms of like you know, you know, yeah, that, yes, more term, probably a better word. Um, certainly, um, having more discussions about how then do we best market and promote yeah. what services are then available both in custody and upon release is something that I think has come up all over the place, quite honestly, whether yeah. it's directly from the individuals themselves, from providers, um, the, the, yeah. Oh, not. Um, for the dental care in custody, um, when I was in custody, the only dental care that was offered was, was extraction. So we have a full time. Oh, okay. I don't speak for medical. They're not me. They don't for me. But there's a full time. They, they actually just hired a second one. If I'm not mistaken. Do billings and medical. They have a, They have full dental care. Oh, that's great. I didn't know they do that. And it. Uh, I'll be honest. I'm pretty sure they do the most emergent. Do, and so they're gonna work with people with like the most emergent patients. Yeah. Kind of like an ER, almost. But uh, they do So I have a question to piggyback off of what Rena said. So could disconnect where yes, the service is being provided, but if it's not considered urgent by the time that they would have gotten around to them, they've either been released or moved. It's always a possibility. Like okay. that's it. And I and I apologize. I'm, I'm, I don't cover medical, so okay. I don't want to speak for them totally, but. Yeah, they, they they have a triage line um, every single morning, every day. Any any in custody person can pick up the line. They're they're announced medical will call the module and say, okay, triage is open, and that's when they can go and they can call and they actually speak to medical at that time. And they these are the issues we have, and then they get an appointment based on that. Um, it could be dental, it could be infection. I had a sick or I'm coughing, or you know what I mean. Like just like we would call Kaiser or the advice nurse, it's kind of that's what that is. Um, mental health can be addressed on those lines as well. Uh, mental health, uh, they do come onto the module every day as well. And so if they're not there to see you, they will talk to you and like schedule an appointment or make a time. If it's an emergent mental health issue, you talk to the deputy or the deputy may call them anyway for you. And then like that's, they're pretty well trained right now. Uh, that mental health is something that's, they come out immediately. So that one's a little bit different. That's not an emergency where you're not going to get seen with mental health. But with dental, it might be that, okay, your appointment is in three weeks from now, but you'll get let out in two weeks. So that's a possibility. Is there any way we could get more information about like how many calls are being made on average, how long the time frame is for them to get an appointment? Um, just so that we know, is it that the service is not being offered, or that maybe we need to expand the service um, so that we can meet the needs of those that, that's incarcerated? So that's through the county. Um, okay. It is county medical, but that's not information that I would be able okay. to provide for you at all. Um, Dr. Sutherland, I'm on the detention health. Yeah. Because yeah, it'd be cool to find out like, um, like what type of mental health um, is offered. Like, is it therapy? Is it to see a psychiatrist? Like, what, where are the time periods you have to wait? Or? And we might actually get a little teaser of some of that information when we hear from RDA. Um, and their their focus was a little bit more on mm -hmm. the health services that are being provided, and and again, how the uh, uh, expansion of Medi-Cal um, through Cal Aim would would support some of those resources. So some of those things came up. Yeah. Latanya, um, Jill, and Nicole have their hand raised. Yes, I'm going to go right to them. Jill had her hand up for a, a moment. I'm going to go directly to Jill and then Nicole and then Ozzy. Thank, okay. thank you. Um, so um, Jody, I was part of all of the discussions as they were developing these surveys and um, it was purposefully written so that it could be determined since the cab has such a broad variety of uh, partners who are funded and in the detention system, the goal was really to determine whether or not the people in the system were getting connected to and had the information. Um, and so it was sort of a first attempt, I believe the way the word, the 
the questions are worded to really understand what the people in custody knew and um, how things could be improved if they weren't aware of services. So I wouldn't take this as um, that services aren't being provided in custody or people don't have opportunities. It was really sort of more of a temperature check to determine those people in custody, what they knew, what they heard, because you know providers are saying we're doing X, Y, Z and we're reaching all of these people. And it was sort of a temperature check to determine are those people being reached really from their perspective? And of course, you know, just like anything we do, people will say, I had no idea. Um, so I wouldn't look at it from a perspective of we're not providing these services. What's wrong? It was more of an idea to do exactly what you're saying is how, how come they don't know about these services? How come they're not connecting to these services? Um, so, so I would, really just look at it more that way, like what can we do better um, as not only a county, but as our CBOs to ensure that those services are, the connections are being made. Thank you, Jill. I'm, not, I'm Nicole. Uh, thank you. It wasn't really a question. I was going to uh, point out that um, some of the information that we could, um, I open up for you guys to join some of the work groups. You may be, it may be uh, beneficial as you're creating your questions because there is a breakdown in programs. We haven't did the pre and post release one yet, but we've done behavioral health. Uh, we're doing it, well, not behavioral, excuse me, housing. We're doing behavioral health and employment on Friday. Um, and hopefully we will have some information from detention help when we get over to the pre and post release part of it to learn more about the in custody. But there's presentations that are breaking down the services that may be, excuse me, that may be beneficial to programs and services when you're creating your questions. So um, I know we can't really talk together over that stuff, but that information from both parts may be really helpful in identifying uh, some of the questions you said about services. Thank you. Nicole, I have a quick question. Um, one of the things that they did um, highlight is that for sex offender, I think it was number 290, would that be, will we look at what providers, vendors we have to support them for those that are being released? Is that going to be covered um, in your meetings as you guys go farther into finding out the needs? It wasn't a particular question, but that information has been provided from providers, so it has been something that they included. I do know in uh, this meeting that's coming up, if you are unable to join it, um, you can look at uh, the PowerPoint. It's really thick, but it's some really great information there, and they do talk about some of that stuff, so that information is being provided. So much. And, and just to add, if there are some additional things that, that you may see that was missed that are beneficial to collect from the county providers, we're open to definitely hear that from programs and services. Thank you. Abby? Yes, thank you. Uh, I just have a clarifying question, and that's relative to um, what I heard earlier. Um, when inmates are in custody, um, it's we can make appointments. And my visual is they can pick a phone up. Is it them picking the phone up or is it a sheriff that's over them picking the phone up to make those appointments? How does that process work? They literally are picking up the phone themselves. Okay. Yeah, and so it's a, they pick up the phone and it dials straight to medical triage. Um, they have a, a shortcut a number, like it's not a full number and it's posted up there in different breaches of three facilities. A medical call goes and okay, triage is open and that means they have someone sitting at the desk waiting to talk to them and then they line up and they start picking their calls and they they work it out that way like oh you know they explain whatever their issues directly to medical which is a nurse on the other line. Can I ask a question for the desk? Uh, how long has this process been in place for the different I can speak to that slightly. I've been here 24 years and I worked in the jail 24 years ago and in that process with the okay. county called down three times though right? So they have a treat Triage hour every single day. Okay. So they yeah, have a. Well, and they call it the other time they come out of the room. So yeah, okay. they make an announcement. So medical will call down, and then the DFD will make an announcement and say triage lines are open. Does anybody want to? And that's when they do it. If they don't want to call, they can always write a, a, a request slip as well to medical or to mental health. And so that way, if they're not calling the triage line, they still have a way to send information to medical, and those get picked up and answered daily. 
And just to answer, uh, one of the key things people were talking about was being able to apply for SSI, SSDI in custody. Um, Nicole with with uh, with us inside in partnership with Jody and the Social Security Office, we have now established a way for people in custody to apply for SSI, SSDI prior to release. Thank you. Any questions from anyone in the room before we move on with the agenda from the board? Oh, and I have a question. So for that, um, how does the inmate get to you guys to be able to apply? Like, do you guys talk to old inmates or like how does, how does that? So that process really like, just rolled out maybe a week and a half ago, oh, okay. two weeks ago. So the people who know about it right now are the ones that are being case managed by Game Plan for Success. Okay. While we get everything ready to put up on the tablet, for general information for other people to know how to access that. I have a question. You guys do provide a lot of services. So how do the inmates know that these services exist? Is it word of mouth? Is it posted up somewhere? Um, yes. The information. Yes. Yeah, but like how do they get that information? So we do have uh, the schedule posted for all the programs that come onto the modules. Okay. Um, so if there's or not on the model, a lot at West County specifically, they go to a class or they go to, um, so it is posted there. They do do announcements every day, so they'll come in and if Men and Women of Purpose is there, they're going to say Men and Women of Purpose, who's Cuba, and so that's when they line up as well. Same thing for AA and NA, so it's not just a schedule, it is, it's announced every single time that they come in. Um, same thing at MDF as well, actually, but uh, Yes, we have an a introduction video, an orientation mm -hmm. um, that talks about it as well. That's a lot of information at one time, though. So unfortunately, like at the first time you're coming to jail, I can't imagine that that's a fun experience for you and that you would take in everything on that video. So we also have all that information now on the tablets as well. Oh, that's awesome. And we do have each of our programs have been offered uh, access to the tablets. So if there's something that they want, we have a whole re-entry tab on the tablets and it's got all of um, specifically men and women of purpose, but it's all the re-entry information that they hand out to every person all the time. So it's got all the programs that we offer. Um, AODS has their own special stuff posted throughout. They have their own hotline um, and they can call AODS directly, um, but that's posted and it's on the tablets. Uh, Men and Women of Purpose has all their stuff on the tablets. They have all their videos on the tablets, GPS, and you know, they both have two different versions on the tablets. So they have the full uh, CCOE has on each tablet in the facilities. So West County has the full array of classes on the West County tablets, MDF on the MDF tablets, Marsh Creek on the Marsh Creek tablets. Um, Janet's got her stuff and it's starting to come through more. She's going to put all her stuff on all the tablets. So that way it'll go through that way as well. It's everywhere, basically. Yeah, okay. Might be a little too much. <laughs> <laughs> so that's real. La cool. <laughs> Latanya, okay. um, yeah. Michelle has her hand raised. And before we get to Michelle, Julia wants to know, is the triage line available at all adult facilities? Yes. The triage line is available everywhere, yes. Yeah. Michelle? Thank you. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, good morning. Um, <clears throat> I have a question with regards to an inmate who needs to go use the phone to make a contact call to whatever health care department they need, mental health, dental, or some sort of physical ailment that's coming up for them. Uh, I'm just curious, what are the, the time restrictions? Like, do they have to prioritize free time out in the yard, so to speak? versus having to stay on the phone to make these phone calls. How, how, what sort of time allotments are there to do that type of uh, outreach to those various departments? Sure, it, it, in the past, yes, that's exactly, they would have had to have prioritized. They'd have to, you know, during triage, during only, you know, during the triage hour, but they may have had to use some of their free time to line up the phones on the wall. Um, but right now with the tablets, there's actually phones on the tablet. So they're assigned a tablet in the morning mm. if they'd like one so they can go and check out a tablet. And there's a phone on the tablet. It works exactly the same as the phone on the wall. And they can make mm. calls to triage. They can make calls to mental health. They can make calls to AODS or their loved ones. Um, 
while they're in the room. It doesn't even have to be during sleep time. So now the access is open. Okay, that's really good to know. And then just a really quick follow up question for um, <clears throat> the healthcare professionals on the other side. Um, is there like somebody that's always available to respond or or are you aware that many of the inmates have to do continuous outreach, kind of like how they have to do out in free society, <laughs> like the rest of us? <laughs> <laughs> like when I call Kaiser every morning to see if there's a new appointment? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> I apologize, but that would be under detention med uh, medical, and I, I do not know that answer. I do know that they have people there 24-7 in the two main facilities and mm. at Marsh Creek. There's two shifts, so they're not 24-7, but there is two shifts at Marsh Creek. Uh, but I, I do not know um, how often or how easily it is to get an appointment or how they prioritize who gets what appointments. That that I know it's based on the doctors and where the doctors would be, but I do not know okay. exactly. Thank you. Thank you. So moving along, next on the agenda, it's going to be Cal AIM Consumer Voice Cycle One Finding with CAF. And I'm going to hand it over to Julia Lang. Hello, good morning, and thank you so much for hosting us today at your meeting. Um, Kimmy, it was amazing to see your findings, and um, I'm excited for everyone get, to get to draw the, the connections between what we found um, so we're with RDA Consulting, we're working with health services currently to really look at how people with lived experience are being incorporated into the planning process around CalAIM Justice Initiative. And so ensuring that we are talking to people who have lived experience and incorporating what we learn into the planning processes. Next slide. So we're going to talk a little bit about the purpose, how we engaged folks, um, the process and limitations, and then the feedback findings and some time for q and I'm realizing, Courtney, I think these are not the right slides. <laughs> I can share them. I wasn't sharing those, Julie. I think they're what we sent. Oh, oh, okay. I'm going to have Courtney share if that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. I looked at the timing on those and I was like, oh, we do not have that much time to share. These might not be the right slides. All right, hold on. Got him. Oh, but I'm... There you are. Okay, next slide. Maybe I just didn't update that part. Um, so I'm gonna jump into the why of this project. Why do we go in um, to facilities and chat with people about uh, their access to health and behavioral health and their experiences with reentry? Next. Um, we really wanna inform this planning process and make sure feedback is um, centered in, in this work, um, we know that there's a lot of systems redesign that's gonna happen and a lot of money funneling in from CalAIM through PATH dollars. Um, and we wanna make sure the, the you know, programming gets designed in a way that's oriented towards people's well-being and success from their vantage. Next. So um, we are doing a series of data collection. Our first cycle uh, was going into facilities and having feedback sessions. Next. We, uh, we had a great meeting with a bunch of providers where we elevated uh, the main principles for engaging folks with lived experience. So this is an aggregated list of people's insights. So addressing power, power dynamics, prioritizing people with lived experience, creating physical and psychological safety, and equipping everyone to fully engage, making sure we're bringing enough information, uh, make sure we're honoring the engagement uh, through incentives where possible, which is quite a bit trickier when it comes to doing this in facilities, but really um, coming in in a trauma-informed and culturally competent way was crucial to this effort. Next. 
So uh, from September to October last fall, we spoke to 33 people. Um, we did this through five unique feedback sessions, which were essentially focus groups. People were self-selecting to participate. And then we did four interviews for folks who could not uh, meet in groups. And we engaged people at three facilities, West, Martinez, and Juvenile Hall. Um, in these discussions, we talked about kind of a meta question of how do you like to give feedback? What works for you? How do you like to be engaged? Um, and what is your experience being asked for your feedback? And then we moved on to talking about um, Medi-Cal and understanding what insurance they had and how, how and if they were being talked to about their current Medi-Cal status and um, gaining access to application support if needed. Um, we know that's the initial mandate of the Calian JI initiative. So uh, was to make sure that people have access to applying and that there are defined processes in place for that. Um, and then next we talked about behavioral health and physical health access and quality in facilities and upon reentry. We, we really framed this as wellness and um, had really thought-provoking discussions on what people have experienced and what they would like to see. Next. Process and limitations, next. Um, I'll speed through this, but um, we did thematic analysis as well. So we developed a code book. We use a qualitative analysis software called InVivo. Um, we had two folks identifying themes had intercoder reliability there as well, and um, came to conclusions based on that thematic analysis. We had some limitations. Uh, as we all know in this room, that things are very different from facility to facility. And so um, even just how we collected data, some places we had a laptop we got to take notes on, some places we were handwriting notes, which I don't recommend for data collection. So um, as you can tell, you know, the the data was less thorough in some spaces than others. Um, and this was collected only um, from people who are 18 years or older. And it was based on individual interest and consent for participation. So um, we opted to remove indications of facility location. We only talked to 33 folks. It would have been um, really easy to have some comments uh, be identifiable. So we made that uh, call to not delineate by facility or population. Um, and and I, I think like uh, was mentioned with the surveys, these findings are a sample of experiences. They by no means um, are indicative of, you know, um, they can't be applied broadly across the spectrum. These are people's experiences and should be taken as people's experiences. And they're experiences that are helping inform those of us who are not ourselves in that situation currently. So it's getting real time information about people's experiences. Next. I'm gonna pass this over to Courtney to tell us about themes and learnings and dig into our findings. Go ahead, Courtney. All right, thanks, Julia. Um, so from, from that work, the the key themes and learnings that we really had come forward were there was a strong desire to have opportunities to share feedback, um, but there were still some underlying concerns about what the impacts of providing that feedback might be. Uh, we also identified individuals shared the need for increased information about Medi-Cal and continued support for enrollment. And then participants defined desired improvements on existing services and ideas for new services during incarceration and upon release. And we go into that a little bit more in these next slides for you. So when we think about that, that first aspect of feedback um, experience, what we really heard were um, experiences of being asked for feedback were not commonplace. Um, that was some of the expression there. If it, individuals share that they do not know how their feedback is used to make changes, um, feeling like maybe it goes nowhere. And then individuals who were participating in feedback are 
activities with RDA really were um, expressing a lot of gratitude for opportunities to share and having conversation and really expressed a desire for more opportunities to um, to have more groups and reach more individuals than we were talking to in this first cycle. Um, and so how these slides are structured as we go through is we kind of have those summary findings and then similar pulled out some of those kind of key quotes and aspects that were shared. So some of the quotes that really came forward um, about feedback and their experiences were this, um, is the first, while in custody, they ask us questions, but nothing ever changes. When they ask for feedback, um, they should do something about it. So that feeling. And then in the experience, I know you are sitting here and listening. I wouldn't know that if it were just a paper we filled out. Um, I would like more groups like this where people can share their thoughts and it feels good to have a voice and listening. Thank you for that. So again, just kind of expressing that opportunity to have that two-way dialogue. Um, so when we looked in, at feedback on Medi-Cal access and information spe specifically, excuse me, um, this is where we saw that increased desire for information and enrollment support. So most feedback sessions, participants really shared that they had not been talked to about Medi-Cal while incarcerated and that there is a universal need for information on medical insurance and help with applying. So with that, continuing with the theme, um, for women specifically, there was also just a noted of needing more information and internet access to do some of that research and deeper dive on topics such as insurance as well. Um, comments we heard were they don't give information about Medi-Cal um, and others, something like that needs to get renewed. I have Medi-Cal too. I don't know if I need to transition. Do I have to renew it myself? So just some aspects of uncertainty. Um, and a note there that while most participants had Medi-Cal previous to their time of being incarcerated, um, there were a few reporting that they had private insurance, and then, of course, a few who reported that they weren't really aware of what their health care coverage was. So then additional, um, this feels very aligned with what you just heard, but just expressing what additional services and sometimes just more ex and expanded services. Um, one thing that we'll note here with the individuals we were able to talk to, that this may not have been saying that they don't exist, but maybe there were barriers to access or limitations to their knowledge of those services being pre present, present as well. So this is divided into two areas, both in um, jail and then upon re-entry. So some of the services that were really called out were preventative services. So this included things like regular checkups, um, access to healthy food, Dental uh, care with floss and cleanings and eye care was a was a repetitive piece that was brought forward. Um, Health care specific to um, female bodies, so menstrual care, menopause care, and related services there. More comprehensive behavioral health services was also a reoccurring um, piece, so therapy in adult facilities, better access to... Um, AA and NA type settings and meetings and resources. And then increase in one-on-one -on -one therapy was identified, um, but also was, was noted as a success, excuse me, that was identified as abundant and successful at juvenile hall. Um, and then just an overall ask for more organized activities and classes to build employment and life skills and just kind of those meaningful daily life activities. So then kind of following that same suit with additional services desired for re-entry, um, some of these are, of course, very much aligned and similar, but continuing to have connection to health and behavioral health services. So medical care, um, that one-on-one -on -one person, in-person therapy once um, released, um, optometry, substance use disorder support. So those are some of the kind of the reoccurring examples that were voiced. Uh, peer mentorship from those who have experienced 
experience with reentry, both pre and post release that came up kind of as an aspect for both sides of that process. Um, and then support for connections to jobs, housing and documentation. And I think aspects around that of like warmer handoffs and clearer connections was a was a piece of that. So then again, some of the quotes that really came when we were looking at and hearing more about expanded services. Um, so when we're thinking about preventative services, a comment was, we are now a ward of the state, so the state should take care of us. We are sitting here getting messed up mentally, and they, the state, should take care of us. Um, we are supposed to leave better, but we leave worse. And then in reference to um, the desire for more life skills and that smoother transition in reentry, classes to learn how to get a job, social emotional learning classes, a lot of people are going to be here for one to three years. This is supposed to be rehabilitation for people, but we just sit here, don't want to be stuck here. And then the other was care delivery desired. And so again, kind of looking at um, how participants would like to receive services and what would maybe lead to that better outcome both inside and outside of incarceration. So improved health and behavioral health services access in jail, so more timely and routine care, clearer processes for accessing care about resources and services that are available, and more staff to provide health and mental health services. Um, in this aspect, participants who have been in and out of jail or in prison were able to share more about their experiences when exiting previously. So many of them conveyed the difficulty of that transition, especially with accessing healthcare services. So expressing difficulty of providing finders or provide finding providers, excuse me, um, and especially those who accept Medi-Cal or Medicare. Um, and the need for guidance of where to actually go and access behavioral health care. All right, and then continuing that, improved connections for smoother transitions during reentry. So advanced planning for release. Um, and I know I'm watching time, so I'm going to go a little faster through these last few. I apologize for that. Um, immediate connection to services. So again, that warmer handoff, um, more continuity of care, especially around medications and behavioral health care, um, centralization of resources. So kind of that concept that was brought up often of like a one-stop shop or a more consistent place to go for things like health care, mental health care, dental, job, housing, navigation. Um, and again, some of the quotes that really came forward with that, if a person has an idea, ID upon release, that would alleviate so much. Individuals can't get a job, housing without these, sending us into the public, unhirable, unhelpable, and addicts. If it takes three weeks to get an ID, then we might have great intentions when we get home, but addiction is scary and can pull you back in quickly. And then in relation to that continuity of care aspect is someone was discharged yesterday and I asked, do you know where to get your meds? And she said, no, no one talked to her. We went to the nurse and she said, go to Vail Pharmacy. And she doesn't know where that is. Oh, and I think that's my last for the sharing. So I'm gonna pass back over to Julia for Q and A. Great. Thank you so much, Courtney. Um, and thanks everyone for your attuned listening. You can see there's a lot of crossover be between our findings. And also want to say um, there are Medi-Cal workflows being introduced, implemented currently. And so we have a lot more people getting that assessment and assistance with Medi-Cal than when we interviewed folks in the fall. So just wanted to make that note that um, people might view that differently at this juncture. Um, I know we probably don't have time, but if there are any questions that we can answer, we are more than happy to. I have a question. This is Latanya. Um, one of the things that was indicated is that the ID and it taking three weeks for them to get the ID. 
um, are we looking at what can be done so that we can successfully set them up so that if they are looking to seek employment, that they're not waiting three weeks and in that three weeks, they're returning back to an environment that's not healthy, but comfortable for them. I, I can help with that. And Renee, you might be able to as well a little bit. Um, we, men and women are purposes actually want. This is, this is a look. I'm not giving you like, the most perfect answer here. I have the forms in my office and they're pre-signed. Men and women of purpose goes to the DMV and they are only allowed so many if I'm not mistaken and they have to have a wet signature. So when uh, an individual that would like to have an ID they have to be mailed and signed within 10 days. So I, I signed and date them. Uh, I pre has already signed and predated, like signed them, and he hasn't dated them. I date them for him. And then the individual has to fill it out themselves, and they are responsible for mailing it themselves. And, mm -hmm. and so we do offer IDs. Um, um, unfortunately, I don't know the DMV, like how to get the because they have to pay for that form. And so Men and Women of Purpose pays for it and supplies it to the jail. So um we always have them available but i don't i don't do you do you know any more past what i just said um no because it takes time to get your yeah. id back from dmv it's just the dmv like right. it is what yeah, it is it's but, but they're not going to mail it to the jail they're going to mail it to your, your address. mailing address yeah. they start their process before they actually are released right so um, they're not waiting they have 10 days to mail it so if they start the process um if they uh, while they're inside okay they mail it then okay yes, absolutely Okay. Um, they would have to. They would have to either purchase envelopes and, and the stamps and promise they were in order to do that. We don't require those, but they do have to. They have ten days to get it out, basically. Okay. And then my next question is: um, one of the comments on from was said that um, we're just sitting here. Um, so, and then another person indicated that they would like to, because they're there for one to three years have classes about job skills and employment. Um, do we know what classes are being offered? How often they're being offered? Um, how many people can attend the class and how that's determined so that we can see if we need to revisit that? Yep, we have, we have a contract with Contra Costa County Office of Education. Rebel's on there, Janice here as well. Okay. Uh, we have a workforce readiness class. We have a some free class. We have all kinds of stuff that's happening. They're offered continuously. Um, Can I just say, you know, as a teaser, if you want to learn more about this, oh, there's a commercial break. You know, <laughs> to tune in to tomorrow's meeting, <laughs> <laughs> where we will have employment um, service providers, and this includes um, the employment services that are being provided through the adult school, through GPS, in, while fostering in custody, as well as employment resources that are made available upon release. Okay. So, I have a question. Are those yeah. services offered to men and women? Are those resources offered to men and women? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. So I, I can't remember if you did. Did you put a demographic breakdown on the part? Um, Only for our school students. For the school students. Okay. Sorry. So there are some. Uh, that obviously we only offer the wood shop at Marsh Creek. So that's a, you know, they're not offered to anyone. They're only offered to people at Marsh Creek. We do have a sign shop and a bakery shop. Those are at the PC portion of the, the jail. <laughs> like a food in the building, I don't know how to say. They're, uh, so only protective custody mm -hmm. individuals are, are available to do those two things. So they're not all offered completely to everyone. But any of the school stuff, you have to for everyone, okay. whether it's in person or through package based learning. Thank you. Renee, you had a question? Um, I think Jody just answered my question because I okay. was going to ask is all these um, classes you know, are available at all the facilities? So, any adult school classes are available across the board to everyone. It mm -hmm. may not be in person, but they are available to everyone yeah. through it. At MDF, we don't have a classroom. So they add one onto a building that's that old and <laughs> old. <laughs> but, What's uh, on? We, oh, sorry. Sorry, Jody. Go ahead and finish. We do have everything through packet. Latanya, Julia has her hand raised. Hey, Julia, Ozzie. Yes. Uh, thank you. 
I do have a question in reference to NA and AA. It seems as if NA and AA have come up on both of our things that we've listened to today. Um, maybe I can direct this question to Jason as we're thinking the rest of the discussion about jails. Uh, how are NA and AA um, meeting facilitated? We have an ongoing schedule for those meetings specifically. And if, if you don't mind, yeah. it'll be more me. Okay. Assistant Sheriff Four Howard is here today. This is his first uh, official day in charge of custody. Okay. Oh. <laughs> so I wanted to come. You guys are all people that he will he will be working with continuously. Assistant Sheriff Simpkins is still with the Sheriff's Office. He's just moved to a different department. Assistant Sheriff Four Howard, welcome to our world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's funny. So NA and AA, uh, they're through all three facilities. They're volunteer based. It's it's not a paid organization. It's only people who have you know, past experience. Um, but they are offered on all the modules with the exception of two at NPS, and those are our higher level ones. They're just not trained to deal with those individuals in a group sort of basis, and so it's not safe for them to be on there. Um, and they do have the option that they don't want to be there. They have the option that they're volunteers. But um, I have, in the past two weeks, I have taken from all three of our coordinators from AA, people are not coming to the classes. So what happens is that they come onto the module and then the deputy announces it. And then the AA people specifically, they stay there for 30 minutes anyway. They're, they're just sitting in the classroom by themselves for 30 minutes, just waiting. Like, please see me here. Like the deputy announces it and they do a second announcement and they're still not getting enough attendance. So they're saying that they're actually getting attendance, but at the same time, no one's going to the classes that are being offered on all the modules. I, I have an extended question mm -hmm. because I, I'm in recovery. Mm -hmm. and I made one attempt. My, my, and, and this is really a pet thing for me. Mm -hmm. My whole entire wanting to be of service was to go back into the prisons and mm -hmm. the jails and to share my experience, strength, and hope mm -hmm. as a recovering alcoholic and addict. Mm -hmm. And I told my story the first time that I went, and I was told I was inappropriate. And I just told my story. So I was told by the jail, so maybe you could give me some assistance to tell me why my story as a recovering alcoholic and addict was deemed inappropriate. I, I can't tell you any. Like, maybe off my. Yeah, off my. absolutely. I'd be more than happy. We, we go directly through uh, H&I. So H&I is the one who sponsors all the groups. And so they have a coordinator and all the volunteers go through right. them. But I don't, I don't have an answer for you on that. But that's yeah, more offline, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Back to you. Thank you. Then, uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. I'm gonna go to Julia, and then I'm gonna have Raina after. Yeah, I, I wanted to add that there seems to be a pretty big disparity in uh, what women have access to uh, at West as well. And and there was a statement that um, some of the classes are first come first serve. For NAAA, and that sometimes they get there to sign up and the list is full, um, and like maybe the access to the list uh, isn't as easy for them. Uh, and then, you know, they just they had a lot of comments about their facilities, and we met in a room that was way too small. They're saying they could only have eight people in any kind of classes that are offered, um, and so they're just there was a very clear like physical disparity in space that was available. And then we, we've we heard this come up, um, you know, talking to Malkia and Ed, it's a big concern for them. Um, and uh, I'm going to be raising it to health services as well. Uh, and, and really hoping maybe some of this Calim energy, money, uh, infrastructure can, can help support more equity between populations. Um, and then there's there's obviously a big difference once again in how people are receiving information about what's there and what is actually there, right? So I think that's something that's that stands out to me, uh, especially seeing in Kimmy's in in the results that you shared, Kimmy, um, the percent of people who have learning disabilities. There's a lot of folks who struggle to read. Um, so just, just a consideration, I'm seeing that a lot of information is in written form. And then if it's not in written form, it's right when they're landing, when people are really probably emotionally overwhelmed. So just want to put that consideration out there. Thank you. If, 
if I could just jump in, I'm sorry, Latanya, because I just want to jump on something Julia just said. You said female space, Malkian ed, which makes me think you're talking about juvenile, the juvenile hall, because Malkian ed are over juvenile hall, not detention, which this group is about adult system, not the youth. I'm not talking about juvenile hall. Sorry, that is confusing that Malkia and Ed were involved. They just raised that to me to raise here. So it, it's about adult population. But just to clarify, was that adult population in the detention system or the adult population that's held in juvenile hall? In the detention system, oh. yeah. So not, not they... juvenile hall related. That's a, Julia, since, since you've been in, but that's, a, that's an ongoing issue. I'm not going to tell you that it's not. Um, the, the females, there's a small classroom that they have access to. We are opening up, or at least we're trying to, that the, the long and short of it is we can't mix the men and the women. We can't have women and men in the same room. We can't have women and men crossing the courtyard at the same time. We It's a, it's a security issue as well. And so this is more than just, I... I have a classroom that I can send them to. It's it's staffing and security and how are we going to get them there? How are we getting them back? And that is something that we completely understand is an issue. We have a separate classroom that Jana is starting to use on Fridays for, for her groups. We do not have that for full on access yet, but we're it is something and I completely understand where you're coming from and we do know that it is an issue. Yeah. And my question was just, is NA and A um, offered in different languages, or is it just English? Spanish as well. Okay. Yeah. A qu quick question and follow-up to what you just mentioned, Jody. So in the expansion of the um, the West County facility, does that address some of those things? And it, and it has me thinking that it's been a long time since folks, gosh, I I remember it's been many, many years since we last heard of a full scale prison. And I mean, I'm meaning in this kind of space, like having all of that about the um, the build out and what it's planning to, to have and incorporate and all of those kind of things. So maybe it's worth doing an update, uh, sharing out on, on something like that in the future. But but anyway, just, but just in that point, is that, is that what? as well it, it, part of the issue is where the women are housed it, it is what it is like that's where they're housed because it's the only spot that we can keep them all together and not mix company um so they used to be where the protective custody were and we ended up having a higher number of protective custody and then we needed women and that's why we had to do the flip flop of it so hopefully moving forward we will have more movement one way or another and we'll it's an issue that we understand and we know it occurs well, that's something 2025 Thank you so much. So we're going to move on to um, discuss and review CAP program service work plan um, on page 84 through 85. Thank you. We're going to take um, a couple of minutes to review it, um, review the timelines. Um, the responsible persons and resources will change for this year. Um, may not have enough time to do it, but I do want to start the process. Um, so the first one is advocacy and support of CAP policy and platform. Undertake a brainstorm, brainstorm priority projects and advocacy. Um, expand housing resources within the county for reentry beyond ABO 109. 
support best practice programs, governance structure, um, expand the justice system, um, collaborate with external boards. Um, we're gonna focus on bias, the ADA compliance for CBO re receiving, and then presentation from all CBOs receiving funding to make presentation before the full cap. Um, last year, we talked and had everyone come out to present at the full cap. I think it would be something worthwhile revisiting um, and having a different set of questions. One, to have a better understanding of you know, their service, ask some more additional questions based off information that was provided. Um, so I wanna kind of like look at it and see if there's anything we wanna take off for 2024. Um, or if you want to leave it as is for the first portion of it. Well, speaking for the housing, the only thing that I would think, and we may not have to go into depth because Nicole already said that she would be addressing it, is to talk about um, sex offender to 290. Latanya, Jill has her hand raised. Yeah. So I was just before this meeting was in a council on homelessness subcommittee meeting and um, Nicole Green, your name was invoked several times, just so you know. Um, they um, are very interested in finding out more about the reentry population and they specifically spoke about this 290 population um, and housing and the need for that and it was a very deep conversation so um, they and Patrice they'll be reaching out to you as well to try and collaborate across the systems um, instead of everybody working individually on these issues. Thank you, Chio. I see your hand, Nicole. Um, yeah, I was just going to piggyback off of um, uh, of Jill. There, um, if you guys are not on those, um, I think I know that you ladies are, but those uh, COC newsletters. There was a like a training for two ninety, and Home Base has really been focusing on that um, a lot around it. So they are, um, Patrice, you're going to get bombarded because me and Jill are sending them your way, <laughs> but. Um, I mean, the good news is, like what Jill said, I'm really excited to see the co uh, collaboration with the county programs and really the uplifting that they're doing for the Justin involved. So um, I know that there's like a million calls that are going on, but um, it's been really exciting to be part of the Council of Homeless and also join those meetings and to have that uplifting voice. So if you have moments um, in your day to be able to do that um, and learn about what they're doing, um, a lot of great information. Um, and to advertise, you know, we did do our housing work group. So there was a lot of information provided by H3 and more questions that um, uh, uh, that we asked them about. So um, uh, 290 is a hot topic right now. Thank you. So this is going to be ongoing. Um, I think we could all work on this. And then we had also broke it down. I know that Last year, I believe in June, we had said that bias training would be a requirement. And then I will continue to do the disability and take the lead on that. When we last spoke about the training, the site that we were using recommending was not up and accessible. I think it's up now. I, right yeah. Now. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Um, but uh, yes, uh, we do have a new provider who is providing the implicit bias training. If you still have to, or if you haven't taken the training, please reach out to me, and I can get you set up. Um, with that. Okay. Did that answer your question? So it's not NIH. I don't think so. No, something happened. Okay. Yeah, something happened where that site was no longer available. So if I took it under NIH, do I have to? Take no, you don't have to take it again. You I believe it's you only have to take it every two years, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So um, as long as it's done now, and I think you submitted your paperwork and everything on that. So that's only at a two year point. You don't have to do it again. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Nicole? Um, I, I was uh, did want to just make a, a note for you, um, Latanya, so you was aware uh, before Crawford left. Um, he and I did um, uh, do a, not a presentation, but did go to some of the Measure X meetings and did uh, put out a request for collaboration with CAP. Um, so looking to definitely follow up on that. So we did invite Measure X to either come to CAB or we come to there, something that we do need to pick back up. So I did want to just um, give you that information to so that you are aware of that, that we did submit um, letters to the meetings that we were unable to go, you know, in person. And then um, I, uh, I did read it out at one of their meetings um, last year. So I'm very happy to see that on your work plan because that was something that I didn't want to get lost in the mist. And then I just had a question um, back to the 290. So there are a lot of providers. Uh, some of our CBOs also right. deal with um, the 290s. I don't know if me and you want to add it to our spreadsheet to ask about that. And then there are some providers that are not funded through AB 109 that do provide support to the 290s as well um, within Contra Costa County. So figuring out how we can gather that information. Perfect. Yeah, we can work together to make sure that that need is being met. Okay. Yeah. Thank okay, you. Perfect. Okay. So this is going to be something we're going to work on ongoing, and I am going to be mindful of time. Um, the next portion of it, um, you know what, let me back up. Are we in agreement that we have the um, them come out this year to present for the full cap, and then we can determine at the next meeting which ones we want, yeah. and then we can start the process? Mm -hmm. Um, the next part is the survey. Um, so we did develop the survey. Um, I do want us to tweak it a little bit for those that are um, the action agencies. Um, one, because we want to know if they are providing service in more than one language and what language it is. And then also, I think it would be worth our while to make sure we have questions about um, cognitive behavior and if that's being offered in or out service because a lot of them were mentioning not having the support or the mindset to support them so that we can reduce the chances of going on is there anything else that you think offhand based off today's presentation and our previous meeting that you may need to add just a suggestion um the possibility of actually having some type of informal education prior to submitting the uh, surveys for any custody to kind of um, make sure that we're prior to the survey that the inmates, the residents are aware that the survey is coming out and kind of like within that educational period would be the responsibility of the total attorney to develop that, what that educational piece would be and how it could be a precursor to the actual survey so that those so you're talking about the service that go into the, inside. right, not the ones that we're actually doing for the, the vendors, the agency. Right. Okay, so I'll put that down. Educational, try to educate prior to submitting surveys. Okay. Perfect, because I was going to, to discuss that to see what we could do different this year, um, because we had 97, and out of the 97, there was only one woman. Um, I do know that it also said that it was a one-week collection deadline yeah. um, for that as well. Also, also, the other thing that was brought to the table was the fact that it was a third grade level of uh, articulation yes. to simulate the actual survey in custody. So that's a big question mark. How do you simplify uh, the 14 questions or if that's going to be the standard to simplify it to a language that's uh, doable for the population? Can I have a couple of uh, suggestions too on this? So um, I think what we heard from RDA, the, the great thing about these two, and I don't know if RDA folks are still on, Julia, Courtney, Yang, thank you guys so much for your time um, to present um, your insights findings. What I think is really awesome and just so serendipitous is that we're, I, I'm assuming for the first time, certainly on behalf of CAP, we, we were able to have two different methods of collecting feedback that was happening at the same time in the jails. So, so we kind of had our way of testing out what's the best mode of feedback to gather from folks that are in custody. We did the survey, which now we're learning, probably didn't have it for about, a, we probably want to extend the amount of time we want to collect 
collect that. We want to ensure that maybe as as surveys are rolling in, if we can see if there's a, a underrepresentation of certain uh, populations or demographics with, within that with a, that are responding to the surveys. But then separately, RDA shared in their presentation that in engaging in discussions and interviews with folks, they actually felt that they were heard more in that sort of uh, setting than more so than having to fill out something on, on paper. So that might be something that we can think through and, and play around with them. And we can certainly um, engage in more conversation with RDA, with Sheriff's Office to see um, you know, what were the challenges, the limitations in terms of logistics to do that kind of thing, especially if you guys are expecting to gather information like this on an annual basis. You know, that is up. Um, doing is always more convenient and easier to do on a current basis, but you really want some rich information and keeping and taking into account the literacy levels, the learning disability that all may play a role. Um, though we did provide the survey in Spanish, and let me tell you, you were nervous about it internally. Now that I remember, you were like, what if we get blurry back in Spanish, handwritten? How are we going to, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, code all of that and, and do some analysis? But we didn't get any back. So that also leads us to think, needing to think through where if, if we are providing something that's going to require response back in another language, with the, also the literacy level of those individuals to the non-English uh, non speaking uh, folks. So all to say, um, I think we learned a lot today, not only just in terms of the findings itself, but the way our approach to collecting feedback mm -hmm. and what's the best way to go. And then also what should be um, uh, the, the, the frequency of mm -hmm. this and what is this information once we gather it? What is it going to utilize for? How is it going to inform you guys' work going forward? Because you heard a lot today. So um, that's some things for you guys to, to kind of deliberate and talk through. In the future, we could, we, we talked about this already. We could do these surveys. They don't have to be paper anymore. Right. That's right. We got, we got talent on yeah. top of that. So if it's a, short video presentation of what the survey is and why we're asking you these questions or and then like that's all doable. It's all something that's we can make happen in the future. Okay. We're still new on the surveys. I figured it out in time. <laughs> so we can figure it out twice. Good question. Um it was someone had asked me before how come we're not offering um post release surveys to um find out if people are actually getting connected to the services that they are offered and stuff like that. Like to find out what happened to them after after they're released are they just left homeless are they able to find employment like what type of things they they need or are needed after being released and possibly um, offering incentives to do that are perfect for where we're headed <laughs> um and so let me say three before i head there i'm gonna have you guys look at because it's gonna be on our list for next our next meeting the different um the different agencies and then we can discuss next month with agencies you wanna work directly with um, to establish a relationship and then to ask the questions as we did in 2023. But your question was perfect um, because on the next page, which is page 86, we've outlined the different agencies. We've outlined the different things that they provide. Um, we've talked about briefly um, in a previous meeting about doing a deeper dive to find out like what they actually provide, what they're referring to someone else, asking more clarifying questions about the county, um, the number of people to ensure that the needs of those that are incarcerated that are being released are being met. Um, so you're right. Um, and I don't know if it's going to be so much a survey, but us as a committee, um, making sure that we understand the full picture, what is being done, and that is being hands off. Uh, we also spoke at the retreat about having a way to kind of follow one of the success stories, the hands that they touched, the services that they received, um, so that we can just we can find out what's working and not working. I think that would be more helpful because it is going to be um, a process. And if they are handed by one agency, it could be considered bias or that they were influenced versus kind of following the whole process. Does that make sense?
that answer. <laughs> so that's going to be one of the things that we also work on is just having deeper conversations with the agencies. Um, we've had them all come out. There was additional questions that came out. Um, and then we kind of realized that it did need to be a, a deeper dive. So yes, you may be providing a service, but are, is it weekly? Is it monthly? Um, out of X amount of people, how many people are being seen so that we have a a better idea. Um, we also are trying to make sure that the Hispanic community are being serviced. Um, one of our presenters indicated that there wasn't there wasn't a lot of tooling resources. The actual thing he did was he showed a slide, and on the slide there was one that had all these tools, and then there was another one that only had two tools, and it was like, and with these two tools, how do we properly use it? Um, so making sure that we actually capture that on the form that they speak in more than one language. So uh, this information that we have on page 86, do you mind speaking to this on how we got this information? I think this it started was, with Crawford. Yeah, this was, um, and we did capture in the last meeting notes of how you all want this information of, uh, broken down further. Um, and we're at time. So what if I may, I recommend that we bring back for your next meeting um, your work plan so that you have more dedicated time to really decide what it is the, the, the items that you guys want to prioritize for the coming year. And then um, we can look again at this uh, chart about because this is only a snapshot of the community programs. This is not necessarily taking into account the county. Um, services, okay? So, but nonetheless, these are your 81 and I community programs. And it was a grid that started as a result of after the pro providers came in and did presentations, uh, new CAP members were trying to take note of, well, what is the full breadth of resources that are made available through these respective uh, program providers to uh, reentry population? So though the way that this is, formatted here is at the top, you see what they're actually contracted, the service that they're contracted to provide, the actual agency that's providing it. But then at the bottom, it may be, uh, though their primary resource, let's say for um, uh, housing, allow family might be just housing, but housing in and of itself is not just simply a bed to place them in, right? It's a whole suite of other ancillary supportive services that are wrapped around that individual while they're engaging in or having access to housing assistance. It's the same for employment. Uh, to some degree, we still legal aid. Our two reentry service hubs are kind of like your catch all, that's your navigation sites for reentry services. So they have other partner agencies that may come through their door, or they are um, field based working directly with not only the other contracted service providers that are listed here, not only the county agencies that we know of that are uh, receiving 8109 funds to provide resources, but then also other organizations that are out there that are touching a similar uh, population mm -hmm. that also have available resources that folks can tap into. So, um, this is just a snapshot. It definitely does not provide the full, not documented here, I'll say, the full breadth and description of all that is available, but this was just a, sort of a beginning place. Um, so we can certainly talk through a little bit more of how this could be structured a little bit better so you could understand the full landscape. I want to say, Jenna, you mentioned before about possibly a, a not mapping, but serve, almost mm -hmm. like service mapping, mm -hmm. service mapping, to really get a full sense of what um, what all is available. Mm -hmm. I like to say, though, if I can, um, there's a lot out there. <laughs> there's a lot of resources that are available. I think where we're at as a system is a couple of places, a couple of things. Um, the integration of services, mm -hmm. um, expansion or number of slots, especially in those high critical need areas like housing, for example, like behavioral health, those are like those key areas where there's not always enough room, not enough slots, there's waiting lists, 
on and on and on. Um, also certain target supports for certain subpopulations, such as gender responsive um, services or services that are wrapped, wrapped around an entire family. Um, so there are definitely some gaps here, but that is just, I think we're at a level where we can now go to a 2.0, if you will, mm -hmm. in our service delivery. But as you can see indicated here, and this is just the community programs, there's a ton that's available. Oh, um, oh, sorry. Nicole, Nicole? I, I was just uh, nodding my head and agreeing with uh, Patrice because I'm getting really e e excited as, as she said, this is only the community programs. And there is, um, what excites me is there are a lot of programs outside of ones that we know. Um, and Patrice is correct, there's limitations to it, um, but really identifying the barriers like we're doing now that our population face understanding the programs that are available to them. So not only are we looking at our CBOs, but we're also trying to tie them to those um, other programs, regardless of that waiting list, but being able to ensure that they're connected to it will help us out. So it's a long process. It's before they release, getting that plan together, what does it look like upon their release? What can we do short-term and what can we do long-term? But I'm really excited about the work that CAB is doing, especially programs and services. And I think and hope by this year that on both parts with us collaborating, we'll be able to not only def uh, identify from the CBO standpoint, but really have a better connection from a county standpoint so that we can help fill those gaps, right? And figure out really where um, that need is. And like um, Patrice said, what John was asking for, I've always wanted to see a flow map, right? Of just everything in the county. I know it's wishful thinking, but not just CBOs. I just wanted a big picture of the whole world because there's so much. So um, I just piggyback off of Patrice, but there are a lot of services that are available for our participants. There will never be enough but it's just identifying um, the criteria, speaking up for them, and then figuring out how we can navigate through those. So I'm looking forward to y'all work for 2024. Thank you. So the next action steps for our next meeting will be to go through this in details and do the um, and talk through it. Also look at the survey for the agencies to make any changes that we need to make, and then assigning different agencies for the board for us to begin to reach out to. And then we'll also need to set aside time for the board to talk about the different roles and positions and then have that to be implemented. We never had any talk about who would be the vice chair and who would be the I would maybe recommend inviting the person that I'm going to help with or some of the questions to on to make that way public. Okay. Our next my word for goal. For at, as, at some it's point, just, well, we can make up. Oh, okay, so okay. not the next meeting, but just no, no, as a presenter. Yeah, at some point. Yeah. Okay. To the answer tangent. any of those questions that you had regarding health services. Because okay. I may have lied in that. We got 50 60. <laughs> So we'll do that and then we'll start the timeline for when we'll be reaching out to them. And then um, we'll tie that up. That's probably enough. I don't want to say that we're going to do the ones for the in custody survey because I don't believe we'll have time at the next one. <laughs> and I will recommend you revisit your, your work plan again too. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and the reason why I say that, I just want to caution Cap, I, you guys are awesome. You guys do every year. You have very, very ambitious goals about all the activities you want to try to com uh, complete. And so want to be sure that you are, you guys are really clear on what your priorities will be for the year, those are the activities associated with it. So if there is no other announcements, comments, um, this will adjourn our meeting and I'll see you guys next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good job, Sonia.